Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is mechanical weathering. And mechanical weathering is quite simply breaking rocks into smaller pieces. There's no chemical change going on. The rocks are still the same chemical composition. The only difference is they've gone from one big piece into a bunch of little pieces. Now, there's three processes that we'll look into that cause mechanical weathering. The first is frost wedging. Now, frost wedging is when you have a little crack in the rock, which we can see over here, and it fills up with water. Now, if it gets cold enough, that water will freeze, and as it does so, it expands. And you've seen that. If you take a water bottle, stick it in the freezer, and let it freeze while it's full, it'll expand and distort the plastic. Well, the same is true here in this rock, is it'll expand out like that, and as it does so, you'll notice that the crack's going to get a little bit larger. Now, that crack will fill up with water again, and it'll freeze again, and this will happen over and over again until ultimately it breaks through the rock. Now this can take years or it can be depending on the time, but it's a repeated process. It's not gonna happen just once. The next is unloading and exfoliation. And you can see an example down here. That's if we have this uplift of igneous rock. So we had igneous rock that was buried and it gets thrust up above the surface and now it gets exposed to the elements. And this is where weathering can start to happen. What we'll notice is that it will expand a little bit as it's being uplifted but also you end up with these layers breaking off and it's kind of like the peeling in an onion, so to speak. So that's why we call it exfoliation. You're peeling off these layers. Now the final one is biological activity. And biological activity primarily is gonna be with plants, but it can also be animals and things like that. Anything that's breaking up rocks. So if we start off with our rock, notice there's a little crack in the rock here and a seed can fall in there. If the seed sprouts, then we get a plant growing and its roots are gonna work its way through the crack and ultimately they can split the rock. So we can see that all we're doing here is taking one rock and breaking it down into smaller rocks and that's what mechanical weathering is all about. Now, chemical weathering is gonna be a little bit different. In chemical weathering, what we're doing is we're transforming the rock into something new. Okay, we're causing a chemical reaction to occur. So we're not simply breaking a rock smaller, we're actually changing the composition. Perhaps the most common way for this to happen is the use of water. And when we're talking about water, we talk about acid rain. So what will happen is in the atmosphere, we're releasing out carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide gets into the atmosphere and it'll join up with water that's out there. And it can happen up here in the clouds or it can happen down here on the ground. And what happens is, is the carbon dioxide and the water join together and they form carbonic acid. So it's a real weak acid, but that carbonic acid will react with dolomite and it'll react with limestone, it'll react with marble and things of that nature, and it'll actually cause it to erode or chemically change. You'll change the nature of it, it'll get washed away and things of that nature. So we notice that the rocks are breaking down. Now, when we talk about chemical weathering, another one that we like to bring up is this spheroidal weathering. And you can see an example here. And what that is, is if I took a square, a cube of a rock, and I put it out and exposed it to the elements, the edges here would erode quicker. And if we erode away all the edges, what we end up with is gonna be that spheroid type rock that you can see right over here. So the lesson I'll go into these a little bit more in detail, I just wanted you to get an idea of what it was all about. Now the last topic they'll talk about in the lessons is gonna be this one here, things that'll affect the rate of weathering, how fast this weathering occurs. Now, if I have one big rock, we're gonna get very little chemical weathering on there. It'll just happen on the surfaces. But if I can take that big rock and break it down into smaller pieces, then I'm increasing the amount of surface area and that'll allow chemical weathering to occur a little bit quicker. So with mechanical weathering, what it does is it increases the surface area. Now it'll also increase the weathering and erosion of a, under mechanical means, because if you break it down into smaller pieces, it can get broken down a little bit easier. The other things that will affect it are characteristics of the rock that's being weathered, its composition, what it's made of, and the conditions that it's found in. And also climate. Climate kind of plays back to this one as well. So in the lesson, they'll go through those and explain them a little bit more. But simply, if it's something that's durable, it's not going to weather as quickly as if it's something that's kind of brittle or frail. And then we have differential weathering. And we see a lot of that here. Here we can see a chimney column over here in Bryce Canyon, but you can see how parts of the rock have eroded or weathered away faster than other parts. And that's all we're talking about when we talk about differential weathering. Okay, so that's it for this introductory video. As always, good luck on the lessons and we'll see you in the next video. So when we're looking at the composition of soil, we're gonna take an example here of some good quality soil here. 
we'll notice that the largest component, this 45% here, it's going to be mineral matter. So this is going to be broken down rocks primarily into small enough pieces that it's like clays and silts and sands, things of that nature. So very small sediments. Now we also have 5% organic matter. And this is primarily going to be the decaying and decomposing remains of primarily plants, but also some animals. We also have some microorganisms that are going to play an important role in soil as well. We also need to have water. So it's going to be about 25% water that way. And then we have this 25% air, and this is going to be the holes, the porosity of the soil. So when we get our small little bits of the mineral matter that are all going to line up like this, then we add our little biological components. We'll add a little bit of water in through here. But we still end up with these spaces, and these spaces are going to be about 25%. And this is going to be that air that's going to flow through there. So we'll talk about how all of these different pieces and parts are important for that soil and are necessary for it to be considered fertile and good for plants. And the lesson will go into this in a lot more detail. So now when we talk about texture of soil, what we're talking about primarily is what it's made up of, what kind of things we're seeing in there, what size are the mineral deposits. So we can talk about being whether it's clay sized or sand sized or silt sized. And then where it falls into this is about where we start to find out what it is. So if it's primarily clay, we'll call it a clay soil. If it's primarily sand, it'll be a sandy soil, so a sandy loam or a sandy clay. And then if it's going to be silt is where we get our other low, our clay loams and our silty loams and things of that nature. So you can see by the size of the particles inside is how we determine its texture. And this kind of graph shows you a little bit and the lessons will go into it a little bit more. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about soil formation. When we're talking about soil formation, there's a bunch of different things that factor into it. And the first one is going to be parent material. And if we look over here in this drawing, what we see is we have the bedrock, which is the original rock, undisturbed rock layer. Now that'll get broken down through weathering, and if it stays still, then we end up with residual soil. That's soil that's going to be broken down, and the, the sediments just kind of stay right there. If the sediments are transported, then we end up with transported soil. And that's going to be where it's moved down by a river through erosional processes, and it's no longer where it broke down from the bedrock, but it's been moved from one place to another. Now the next component is time, and it does take a lot of time for soil to form because you're not talking about a rock that's going to magically, boom, turn into soil overnight. The rock needs to be broken down. You have to have some pioneer species move in and then they have to die off and you have to get that biological decaying stuff there. So it takes a long time for soil to form. Now, this time can be affected by things like climate and by organisms. So if there's a warm, moist climate where you get a lot more weathering occurring and you get a lot more plant growth and decay, then you'll see the soil form a little bit quicker. If it's a dry climate like a desert, it can take a long time to make just a little bit of soil. The organisms are primarily microorganisms, and those will be like bacteria and stuff, which play an important role in the nitrogen cycle, which you can see down here. Um, we have a lot of nitrogen in the air, but plants and animals can't use that, so we have bacteria that will fix that into plants' usable form, and then we can get it that way. And then finally, slope. If you look at a mountain, if we have a nice, long, gradual slope like this, it's going to stick around more. You'll probably get some more soils, and it'll form deeper here. Versus if it's a real steep slope, then there's not a lot of places for the soil to accumulate, and you end up with a very thin or almost no soil at all. Now, if we take a cross-section of the soil, so we're going to take a look down this way, we can break it up into a bunch of different regions, and primarily we're going to go through four of those. So the very top layer is the A horizon, and that's called your topsoil. And this is where we see our primary soil that we're used to. It's loose, it's partly decayed organic matter, there's mineral matter mixed in with some organic matter. This is topsoil, this is the dirt that we're familiar with. If we go down to the B horizon, then what we notice is we have some clay that's transported from above. So what that means is the clay and stuff is going to settle down into the B horizon here. In the C horizon down here, so we have the A, B, and the C horizon here, that's where we're going to have this just partially weathered parent material. And that's going to be down here. This is our unweathered, our parent material. We'll call it a P here. This is our bedrock that's just breaking up. So here we have just simply our bedrock is down here. Here we're going to have broken up. So we're going to have weathered rock is all. Okay. 
The next layer of the B horizon is primarily going to be clay, and that's where about as deep down as the roots are going to go. And then we end up with our soil here, our dirt, let's call it. And that's going to be our A horizon. So you can see the different parts here. In the lessons, they'll go into them in a lot more detail. I just kind of wanted to give you a quick overview real fast. Okay, so let's take a quick look at our three basic soil types. We have the petal fir, the petal cow, and the laterite. The petal fir gets its name, petal means soil, and there's a lot of aluminum and iron inside of there. So because we have these iron oxide and aluminum oxides, what we're noticing is we get a rich brownish, kind of browny red color in soil. And this is what we find primarily in the east and the woods, in the forests and such. Now we also have the petal cow. Petal cow is high in calcium and aluminum. That's why it's called petal cow. And it has this aluminum that you can see in this calcium that you're going to see over here. And it's going to be a lighter colored brown, almost a grayish colored soil. And then finally we have the laterite, which is from the tropics. And that one's going to be a really noticeable red soil. And the reason for that is it has this iron oxides in it and the iron rich clay. And that kind of leaves it that reddish color. Now, one thing to notice with the laterite is it doesn't have very much hummus because... The organic material decomposes so quickly in these tropical areas so you don't get a lot of buildup like you'll see over here in our petal fir. So these are our three basic types. The lesson will go into them in a lot more detail. I just wanted you to get a quick look at them. Now humans play a major role in soil erosion. Um, what we've done is we have some not great practices when we're building stuff and things like that. We cut down all the forests and the rains come through and we take out the roots and that allows the soil to transport away. So we have a big issue with that one. Um, when we allow that to happen, then we end up with sediment deposition, which is where it falls out of the rivers. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next couple of units. But we do have ways of controlling erosion. Um, what we can do is if we have our land here and the winds blowing, we can put up windbreaks and primarily it's going to be pine trees because they grow kind of fast and that'll stop wind erosion from occurring. We kind of knock the wind down where it's close to the ground so it doesn't have the ability to blow away the dirt. We can also terrace. So if we're going up a mountainside, we'll kind of level it like this and we'll kind of grow it in these terraces. And that way we have plants growing here. But we were actually causing as the water goes down, it'll fill and then it's a slower trickle down. So if you see the water, instead of it just whooshing down and taking away all the soil, it kind of pools here for a little bit and then drips over and drips over. So it's a slower pathway for it to go down and that'll kind of save the soil a little bit there as well. And then finally, we'll rotate crops around. And that works really well because we can put in crops that will replenish soil nutrients and then we'll use ones that will use those up and then go back and replenish. And that's what we're talking about. So that's it for our video on soil. Like I said, it was just a real quick introduction. The lesson will give you more. As always, good luck on the lesson, and we'll see you in the next video. So let's talk about what mass movements are and what triggers them. Mass movements are when we're moving a large section of the Earth's crust at a time. Um, we're not talking a tectonic plate size, but we're talking like a side of a mountain. It's like a rock slide, a mud slide, things of that nature. We'll talk about the different examples so you can see what they are. But they all have certain triggers, and the biggest trigger is going to be gravity. And quite simply, that's any time I take something and lift it up above the ground. So if I put a rock on top of a hill here, gravity is going to want to pull it back down this hill. And we see that happening a lot with these mass movements. Now we can talk about saturation of surface materials. If we get it wet, then it tends to slide a little bit more. If it gets over wet, then it can flow down the side of a mountain as well. Over steepening, if we take a mountain that had a nice little slope like this, but then we decide that we're going to cut this part off. Okay, so we take out this part here, then you can see how now it's going to be steeper and that's going to be a little bit more of a trigger that we can see these mass movements happen. We can take away the vegetation. Um, remember that if we have plants here, the plants all have roots. We'll draw the roots coming down like this. You can kind of see what we're talking about. So if I have these roots in the soil, that's going to kind of hold this clump of soil together. So if I pull out these, then now what we have is we have the soil that no longer has the roots and that'll allow it to move a little bit easier as well. And then final trigger is going to be an earthquake. And that's going to cause a lot of shaking to happen and it'll shake up the loose things per se. And that's going to trigger some of these mass movements as well. So probably the simplest of all mass movements is going to be the rock falls. And what that simply is, it's a rock falling, exactly like the name says. So you'll notice in the picture here, we had a rock that was way up on this cliff here, 
it got dislodged somehow through weathering or something caused it and then gravity took over and it plunged the rock down the hill like this so rock falls are going to be a little bit smaller and what we're going to notice is it generally tends to be just like a little bit here like you can see contained and it's just simply rocks falling down now slides are going to be a little bit different in slides we have a block of material so you're going to see a lot more of that material fall if we had a rock fall, it would be a single solitary rock that just kind of plunged down. But here, what you see is in a slide, this whole face broke loose and just came crumbling down like this. So you can see it's generally going to give us a lot more material that's going to be there. And we can see these in areas where you have like a weathering and erosion on a cliffside. And you can see how there's like these natural cracks here. And that whole section can be the next one to fall down. Now we also can talk about a slump, and a slump is downward along a curved surface. So what you'll notice here is we have a crescent shape kind of a deal. They cut it here, but you'd notice that if you looked up above, you would see this crescent kind of a shape here, and then this mass movement is going to be all of this stuff that flowed down from that crescent shape, and you can kind of see it coming through here. This is what a slump would look like. So you can tell it's a slump and not a slide. Slides tend to be straight, slumps are gonna be curved. So that's how we can tell the difference between the two. Now we talked about water getting involved here. If we add water to it, then we get a flow. So we can have a mud flow, which is kind of like what you see in the picture here, where you're seeing that all of the water came down, heavy rains, rapid spring melting of snows, things of that nature, you're gonna get a lot of water up in here. And that's going to cause it to just flow down into this like river of mud that you can see going on here. So a flow is when we have water and it just flows down the mountain. And then finally we have creep. And creep is really slow. That's the key. You want to remember that it's slow. Basically when we really can see the effects of it. What it's caused by is caused by freezing and thawing. So as it freezes, it's going to cause it to expand. And then when it thaws out, so you see the expansion when it's freezing, you will see this expansion and then it'll contract when it thaws so we kind of see this over a period of time this fluctuating of the soil and what happens is this objects that used to stand up straight like this tombstone would have we notice that over time they start to tilt downhill like this and this is all that creep is that's what we'll see going on here so you can see it in tombstones fence posts telephone poles things of that nature Okay, well that's it for this video. As always, good luck in the lessons and the quizzes, and we'll see you in the next video.